Hello and welcome to the Game Theory Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Vicini. We are presented by The Athletic. Today on the show, Danny LaRue is in the building. It is 6 a.m. Melbourne time, <laughs> Thursday of the NCAA tournament in the United States. My body is breaking down as we talk. Uh, I am very tired. It is, I've been up since three o'clock in the morning. I've had internet issues, but I am here. I am ready. And I am excited to talk about Danny LaRue. We are not talking college basketball. Although, Danny, if you've watched any of the two games to start the day, have you? Very little. I watched the first half of the Michigan um, Michigan game. And then I watched like the for about the first half of the Providence game. And then I was recording my own show. Did you enjoy uh, your first experience with thick, gaudy David Roddy? Yes, very much so. <laughs> what a what a king. Uh, yes. v- very much a like potential two-way player in the NBA at some point soon. Um, but we're not going to talk about college basketball here. We are going to talk about the fact that I think in the NBA right now, there are more stars playing at a high level than I have ever seen in previous times in the NBA. And that is just something that is worth recognizing and discussing on some level because it's just so unbelievable. And then we're going to follow that up talking a bit about MVP and a bit about defensive player of the year. Shorter show today, more like 40 to 45 minutes because, you know. Oh, come on. You don't want to do two hours. Your body's not going to (laughs) completely, you know, your your spine is not going to eject itself just out of pure frustration. Your spine is going to rage quit. But, but yeah, fun. my uh, it's it's funny. One of my good friends in college, I lived with him for two years, Jeff. Uh, anytime we'd like go out like drinking and then the next morning you eat something and you feel like your body uh, is about to like just hurl it back at you, like in front of your face. <laughs> uh, we would like look at each other and just go, my body is rejecting the Chipotle. <laughs> and I feel like my body right now is rejecting uh, being awake at this moment but but to get to your main point i I think it is a very fair one and it's something that we should fully appreciate and and not only is it great players playing extremely well but it is also great players playing extremely well and not all doing it the same way i mean you have Jokic, who has such uncommon skills for a center and bead has been really dominant Giannis, you know those guys are all bigs in many senses but they do differently but this has been when available a phenomenal kevin durant season LeBron is putting up counting stats at a ridiculous degree. Steph Curry had an amazing first half and a distinctly less amazing second half. But then you also have some of these other real high highs like Kyrie Irving and everything else. And so there are a lot of great players doing extremely well. And we're going into what looks like a wide open playoffs too. Yeah. Like I'm so glad that you mentioned the idea that everyone does it in such a divergent different way. Like, Joel Embiid is just taking people into the post and wrecking people. He's also incredibly skilled and can, you know, catch a pick and pop and pump fake and drive and do everything that you're looking for, right? But he's just like punishing people a lot of the time. Nikola Jokic is so incredibly skilled. His, you know, ability on a basketball court is so multidimensional in terms of passing, ability to take someone down on the block, uh, but also shooting the ball and just being so skilled and leading the break at seven foot with a, or six ten I guess, with a seven foot four wingspan. Kevin Durant is just lethal as ever as a scorer. You mentioned Stephen Curry, but then even like the next tier down, like Jason Tatum over the last 25 games is averaging like 30 points, eight rebounds and six assists or something while shooting like 50, 40, 85. And I, I don't know that there's a case for him as like a top seven player in the NBA. Like, I, I don't know that I can remember a time where someone is playing at that high of a level. And I'm just like, well, he's not better than Luka. He's not better than KD. He's not better than Jokic or Embiid. Like, he's not better than, you know, I'd still take Stephen Curry. I think there's a case he's better than Stephen Curry. But like, you just kind of go up and down the list and you're just like, what are, like, how, how is the league this good? right now it's it's impossible to me well sam here's one way of putting it over the last 15 games that's the filter that you can do on the nba's kind of there on their stat site over the over each of their last 15 games or the last 15 technically their team has played yeah jason tatum 61 percent true shooting on 32 usage that combination is incredible however there are basically 
four other players, actually might even be five, with a higher efficiency on a higher usage right now than Jason Tatum over their team's last 15 games. I'll rattle through those. So I brought up 61.4 and 32. Giannis, 65, 5, and 33. Shea Gildas Alexander, 63 and 33. Oh my God. LeBron, 61.5 and 33, 4. Joel Embiid, 61, 8, and 38. And then some guy named Luka Doncic, 61.4 and 40. It's like, insane. It's absolutely insane. Like the young guards, even just like think about the young guards in the NBA right now. I, look, I know people aren't watching Oklahoma City all that often right now. The leap that Shea Gilders Alexander has taken over those last 15 games has been unbelievable. He is one of the most enjoyable players to watch every single night. I seriously suggest everyone go watch an Oklahoma City game. He is turning into a legitimate potential top 15 player in the NBA at some point. It is staggering how good he is. Trey Young took Atlanta to the Eastern Conference Finals last year. He upset Joel Embiid uh, in Ben Simmons and a top-ranked Philadelphia 76ers team. He is drastically better this season. Like, it's not just a little bit. Like, he is so much better. He can't help it that the rest of that team around him has completely fallen apart defensively. Like, you watch Bogdan Bogdanovich. I mean, he's just, like, kind of a shell of, shell of himself due to injuries right now, I think, in terms of what he can be defensively. Like, Trey Young is incredible. Devin Booker right now is averaging, like, 26 points per game on the best team in the NBA in, like – we think he probably makes second team all NBA. He might be third team all NBA. I mean, like, would you, you take, I'll throw a few others out there. John Morant. Incredible. Yeah. Like Darius I mean, that's Garland. Like, John Morant's been unbelievable. John Morant's like a for sure first or second team all NBA guy. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's not like, can you, re can you really pick him or Devin Booker right now? Like you mentioned Darius Garland, Darius Garland's, unbelievable every single night continue there are two more players that have been insane over this stretch one of which we've alluded to and the other name we haven't mentioned at all one is Kyrie I mean Kyrie Irving he's only played in six of Brooklyn's last 15 games but he's been absolutely dominant and then you know Carl Anthony Towns who has just been absolutely oh incredible and he had that 60 piece, 60 piece on the on the San Antonio Spurs and some of the best trash talk that we've seen in modern vintage as well and this has been one of the hottest offensive stretches in modern NBA history from what I've heard. I'm not capable of doing that kind of research, but we're seeing that. And also what encourages me so much about this group, and especially this can narrow the field a little bit to the MVPs, is that a lot of them have done well defensively too. You have yeah. Giannis and Embiid as rim protectors. Jokic is kind of an overall defender. And then Tatum, I mean, does a good job in the team concept. A lot of the other guys yeah. do. And that is so important because it isn't just putting up a billion points and assists and leading your team to a good offense. We're, we're holding these players to a higher standard. And a lot of them have been a part of successful defenses, maybe not in the moment because right now there are no successful defenses or very few, but overall for the season. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is that I, I feel like I've barely mentioned Giannis here Yeah, and Giannis's level is ridiculous right now. Again, like has raised his level after being the best team on an NBA champion last year and having won two MVP awards. Like I, I cannot get over how good all of the best players in the NBA are right now. Like I, I remember I had Dave Dufour on the podcast a while ago, maybe a month ago. And he brought up the idea that he felt like there were, I can't remember, either five or six top 20 players of all time playing in the NBA right now. And I was like, you know what? Like, we've got LeBron. We've got Kevin Durant. I understand if you think Luka is going to get to that level. Um, you know, I understand if you think Giannis is at that level. Um, you know, I'm uh, off the top. I can't think Steph of Curry. Off, Stephen Curry, obviously, as well. That's five. Like, you really go through it. We're in that beautiful sweet zone right now of incredible emerging young stars that have been in the NBA long enough to like have developed that feel for the game, develop that polish to their game to where they have actually emerged as genuine NBA all-stars and potential superstars. We still have that crazy peak like level guys. 
And then we're kind of at the tail end of like the LeBron, you know, stars and Kevin Durant has just like continued to be a superstar through his thirties, even following an Achilles injury. Oh, and by the way, we don't have Paul George and Kawhi Leonard right now. It right. is like the even crazier thing. Right. And there's, uh, a, there's I, a transition it, point. It. There's a transition point I, that Nate and I, Nate Duncan and I do these crystal ball podcasts where we kind of look two years into the future. And we were a couple of years ago, we talked about this weird point where the existing stars at the time, Harden and Curry and LeBron, were going to age out of peak stuff. They're, not, they could, they're so good that post peak is still very good for them. And we yeah. wondered who was going to step up. And the answer has been twofold. One has been a lot of players really have. And that includes there was this weaker group then in their early to mid 20s that Giannis has, of course, stepped into being in the best player in the world conversation. And Bede has stepped into that conversation. And Jokic is, is incredible, too. Those guys are all 26, 27 now. But then we're also seeing the rising players below them, which are really growing into roles. I mean, Luca is is younger than those guys as well and a bunch of other players. And so the this the game is in really good hands, even as some of these stars at some point are going to age out. But part of what's so encouraging, too, is some of these older players, you know, Curry and Durant are in their age 33 seasons. They're really good shooters and, generally speaking, shooting age as well. And so I don't think they're, my guess is not going to be that they're going to be LeBron James because they're not cyborg sent from the future to rule basketball. But <laughs> if they can be, if they can be very good players at 36, then that changes the shape of the league. Even if some of these young players are rising to take those spots. Yeah. Like I've seen no evidence that Kevin Durant is going to slow down. Like at any point, here. none. Uh, it, it's Ke Kevin Durant coming back from an Achilles injury and being better is like maybe the most remarkable sports science thing that like I can remember. I like there, there had basically been no player who had come back and not just like returned at a reasonable facsimile of himself, but been genuinely better following that injury. Kevin Durant is better. Like it is, it is insane. The level he is at right now. Um, well, and I want to tie it back to another player. You said we, we didn't talk about him enough. There is an argument to be made that this is Giannis Antetokounmpo's best offensive season. And it is, I don't even think it's an argument. I think yeah. it is his best offensive season. I mean, because the year that he, um, his, I think that was his first MVP in 1920. Or no, sorry, that was his second one. Like he led the league in usage. <laughs> in, in 1920. <laughs> yeah. And then, but then, I mean, it, this is this is ridiculous. He has taken on a slightly larger role in terms of assists, and he's not turning the ball over as much. But it's also kind of all the other stuff. Like you, you bring up assists, but then secondary playmaking for LeBron for Giannis has gotten so much better that he's yeah. able to when they form the wall, he can pat make not necessarily the easy pass, he can make the better pass, and that is a yep. really huge step forward for him. And last year, he was the best defensive player in the playoffs, and. Yeah. There's full reason to believe that he can be that again. And so we have this unbelievable group. And then the other thing that we don't have right now, which is so much fun, is we don't have the true super team. And part of that is yeah. the implosion of the Brooklyn Nets. Part of that is just the kind of the way these things are dispersed right now is that no team has more than two of these truly elite talents. And that makes this really fun too. It also gives those players the studio space to really shine and if we want to get into mvp it also changes the way you think about the mvp race yeah let, let's well and by the way like i, I don't want to leave out the best team in the eastern conference like jimmy butler has oh, been yeah. insane this of year bam at a bio we're going to talk about him later bam at a bio has been incredible this year like it, it speaks to the parody that you're discussing uh league-wide in terms of teams that all of these players, all of these superstars that we've talked about, we've probably mentioned 25 of them, it feels like, so far on this podcast. None of them are on the best team in the Eastern Conference. Not to say that Jimmy Butler isn't one of the best 25 players in the NBA. He's undoubtedly one of the 20 best players in the NBA, and we uh, haven't given it, And we haven't given a ton of attention to the players on the team that is running roughshod over the entire NBA, and that's the Phoenix Suns. Booker has been awesome. Chris Paul was yeah. first team All-NBA for me. I actually had him fifth in MVP before he got hurt. And I mean, that is a, it is also an ensemble, you know, Bridges and Aiton and, and everybody yep. else. And they've, and all these teams, generally speaking, have handled injuries a lot this year too. So there have been degree of difficulty challenges on everybody, whether they occurred in the beginning of the season, like Giannis or around now for the Suns. 
So you want to transition into MVP, and I think that that's the right call. Let, let's take a quick commercial break before we do that. Okay, we're back. MVP is, it's for so long, it feels like over the last month, been discussed as a two-person race. At the end of the day, I think it probably is between Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic. Both of those guys have just been so unbelievable. But Luka Doncic and Giannis are coming. And like, I, I, I think we're set up for like one of the best MVP closes to the season that I can remember. I'm extremely excited about it because you have different cases for different reasons. My inclination right now, and I'm not willing to write off anything with Luca, is that his first his first stretch was so cold that it's going to be hard yeah. for him to make it up because somebody like Jokic, like Luca, has been unbelievable during the stretch. You know what? Jokic has too, and Jokic was a lot yeah. better during the beginning of the season. But I think it's a three man race. I've been beating the drum that some of the all in stats have been underappreciating what Giannis has done defensively. It's weird when a guy is listed as your power forward, but is also your primary rim protector. I think there's yeah. some limitations with that. But that is not meant to denigrate what the other two gentlemen are doing. And a part of what makes this competition between, let's call it the top three, so special is that what separates them from, let's say, somebody like Kevin Durant, and Durant's had a great year, but also he's missed a bunch of time, which is an important consideration, is the role within the offense. So that is, if you usage rate, as basketball reference defines it, is more about scoring and turnovers. Joel Embiid leads that of those three guys. But Jokic and Giannis have a larger distribution, playmaking part of the part of the offense. So you can get into a lot of these interesting factors. And it's what do you value? Is it setting up good shots? Is it elevating lesser teammates? Or is it taking a already good team and making them historically dominant? And so you have all of that. And then there's the defensive component of it. And, and Jokic's case there is really fascinating where they've fallen off a cliff whenever he sat. And they've actually been in the same ballpark as some of these other teams. So it is, to me, at this point in time, you can make a completely credible argument for all three of them, even if I think one of them has, at the moment, a better case. So let's hear it. Who, who do you have right now? And I want to be very clear. This is not writing anything off, like I just said. This is setting up to be the best close to an MVP race that I can remember in years. But right now, Danny LaRue, who is your pick for MVP? My pick right now is Nikola Jokic. I think that Jokic's role, he is the most valuable offensive player in the league, whether we're talking guys who've only played 40 games or we're talking people who have played the entire season. I think that he has been the most valuable there. And, you know, the role within the offense, elevating lesser talent, because of the absences of Jamal Murray and functionally Michael Porter Jr. for this year, he has had yeah. to shoulder so much of the creation and scoring <laughs> burdens for this team. And the Denver Nuggets have been awesome offensively when he's been on the floor. They're, they have basically a 118, including the glass, offensive rating this year. And that is better than Giannis. Giannis. The Bucks with Giannis have been very good, and that's better than the Sixers. And when you think about Jokic and the surrounding talent, and yes, each of those players has been missing, you know, Simmons missed the entire year and everything else, that is supremely impressive from Jokic. And then the question for me then becomes, well, has somebody else taken so much on the other end that it, it supersedes it. And to me, the answer is no. I think that Giannis and Embiid have both been really good on defense, and I think their cases are to be appreciated. And Jokic, the case is more how badly they've been with him off rather than they've been this unbelievable defense when he's on the floor, but they also don't have unbelievable defensive talent. So to me, Jok I'm more persuaded by Jokic and it's not like any of these teams is running and hiding. They've all been quite good. And if you want to do the, like, I consider it more fair to talk about the net rating when these guys are on the floor, plus 9.5 when Jokic is on the floor, plus 8.1 when Giannis is on the floor, and plus 6.8 when Joel Embiid is on the floor. So yes, part of what Jokic has done is elevating inferior supporting talent, but he's also elevated them more than the other guys have. I think this is such a... <laughs> such a ridiculous conversation that we it have is. to that we have to parse between these three guys who are all having like i i can't remember a player finishing third in mvp because i think i would have Giannis third right now 
that is averaging 29, 12, and six, basically, while being a top five defender in the league. Like, think about how good that is. That's insane to me. I can't get past it. And, I mean, you also have players that have been awesome, but over a shorter period of time. I mentioned that I had Chris Paul. I had him in the MVP race before he got hurt. Kevin Durant. You know, because to me, part of value is also being on the floor. And there are reasons, you know, like Joel Embiid missed time with COVID. That you know, There are arguments about how to count or not count that. But even if we're just focusing on minutes per game, being out there is extremely important because then these guys are so value, these guys are so good that the minutes they're not on the floor, they have to scramble to replace them. And some of that can be the context of the Bucks or whoever is beating their opponents so thoroughly that those minutes and this came up in the one of the curry harden mvp arguments years ago but these guys are also they're shouldering huge workloads and they're doing it for large amounts of minutes and so thankfully Embiid, Jokic, and and Giannis have stayed pretty healthy over the last little while and so now yeah. they're getting in the mix for in terms of playing about as much as these other guys and that makes it an even easier argument it was already getting there though yeah and it- It's hard because I I don't want to necessarily just like be the guy who pays attention to like games played and minutes played and everything. But like if you're looking for a tiebreaker on some level, the fact that Nikola Jokic has played seven more games than Joel Embiid probably will end up playing 10 more games by the end of the year than Joel Embiid. I think like is a somewhat compelling argument. Like that's a big amount of time. Like that's. And and it's not like, I mean, it was better when they had Drummond, but it's not like the Sixers have a cogent fallback, you know, like the, the replacement player concept is, is important here. And you're also replacing them within the flow of your offense and defense. And there's no, the, the Sixers now have another way to get offense. They have, Harden and, and Tobias Harris and everything else. But like you yeah. can think about that for Denver. And that's a part of why Denver, it, you know, Jokic has this insane on off difference. So that I mentioned they're outscoring opponents by 9.5 per hundred possessions. That goes, I think they're about negative 10 when Jokic is off the floor. It's one of the larger disparities I've ever seen. And so some of that's that like is college just, basketball level disparity. It is because like you, you do see that pretty often with college players because the difference between the best college players um, and like the low end rotation players in college is so much more drastic even than like the best NBA players and the worst NBA players. Sure. The fact that Jokic is like that in the NBA is like unlike something like Danny said that I've ever seen. And and so I don't think that is the whole thing and elevating a team, your team falling off when you're when you're not there. It, it's more an indication of how much you're you're helping. I think that's a good way of thinking yeah. about it. And it's also fun because these guys just don't really have the same kind of weaknesses. It's like you're pointing to, oh, well, they're you know some of the they're not necessarily scheme versatile defensively. Giannis is the most scheme versatile defensively. But a, how much does that matter in the regular season? This isn't saying who is the best playoff player. That is not a part right. of regular season MVP. Never has been. Never should be. If you want to give out a separate award do it the league can do that if you want but like Giannis has gotten better as a shooter Giannis has he's been intermittent at the free throw line and like I mean Embiid is and and Jokic are wonderful free throw shooters for those eyes and Embiid getting to the line the comical degree that he does that is useful for his team not only in terms of the free throws that he hits but it can turn non-shooting fouls into free throws for other players and it can get important players on the other team in foul trouble and so you have these players that are unbelievable talents that are helping their teams in a lot of different ways and also taking so little off the table, which, you know, going back to some of those old Harden arguments was, was a more relevant part of the story. So this is one of those questions that look, we're going into like deep detail on this, right. In in terms of like what the on off numbers look like and you know, what the team looks like and what, uh, Functionally, a player's value has been this season. Do you ever think about MVP just from this baseline level? Who is the best player in the NBA right now? I, 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 I It's hard for me to answer that question, but like, I do think Giannis is the best player in the NBA right now. 
Actually, that's a lie. I think Kevin Durant's probably the best player in the NBA right now, but Kevin Durant has missed too much time, and I don't think you can realistically vote for him in this. Out of those three, I do think I would, if I had to win a seven-game series, I do think I would pick Giannis. I think I'd pick Giannis too, and part of it is that he can be the focal point offensively and defensively, and he can fit alongside a lot of other great players. Like Embiid, he can, especially if you're thinking about it with playoff officiating, there's some limitations there. And I'm still skeptical as, as unbelievable as Jokic has been as a playoff offensive player. And they did make the conference finals. I'm still not sure it's going to hold up against the absolute best, the best. And we got a reminder of that, even though there were, they were shorthanded against the Suns last year, he can't do everything. And they faced a team that was a horrendous matchup for them, but he was a part of why they got torched in that series. And so if I had to pick one of those three for a playoff series, it would be Giannis at this point. And it's, I, but I don't consider that for MVP because it's a separate thing. And I personally would argue that the NBA should give out a most outstanding player award as well. I wish that they did both. And then you could, I, to tie in with something Bill Simmons has brought up before of a separate award, if you win both in the same year, like there's some sort of thing. I was thinking of that, like the Stanley cup where the physical thing transfers from player to player when it happens, because I think most valuable and most outstanding, it also clarifies that they mean two different things. And if the league wants to give out awards for that, if they yeah. want to do something for who you think is the best player or another alternative is you do most outstanding after the playoffs and then it's going to have a ton of recency bias. But if that's what matters to you, then you could do that. But it's, I don't consider it because if that's what the league wanted to measure, they would ask for it. It's a fair point given how close all three of these guys are. Cause I think that that's what I'm trying to like, I'm trying to come up with tiebreakers, right? Like I'm trying to come up with like all three of these guys are having seasons that would win MVP in, I don't know, 80% of seasons. It feels like, like it's something like that. Right. I'm trying to come up with like, okay, how is this going to age best? Cause like, I, I think that matters. Like how, how is this thing going to age best? And how is this going to reflect the basketball season that we watched as well? I yeah. And, and there's also the, the fascinating wrinkle that the, the three players that we consider the highest end for MVP, they're all projected to win about the same number of games. And so this yeah, isn't a circumstance where that is going to factor in as much. There are complicated factors in, in that in terms of a lot of other, other things. But you don't, the, telling the story of the season is, it, it is also involving all these other, you know, the suns and the, and the heat and everything else. And so, right. yeah, we're dealing with tiebreakers. And that's, you know, one of them would often be those weaknesses. And these players don't have, Jokic's steps forward defensively have made this a much, it made it much more palatable for me to choose him. Last year, for me, it was more like he was great, but it was also, you know, he played a lot more and he was really good. And so it's like, okay, you, you're kind of winning it. You're winning it in that way. But this well, year, think about just how much worse last year's MVP race was, right? Like th there just were not as many reasonable, viable candidates. Last we're not. Year. And, and so like Luca would have, I think the season Luca is having right now would have been a genuine MVP, like potential last year. It could have been, yeah. I'd have to, I'd have to really dig in on that and think about it. But it, it would be in the, it would be in the conversation. And I mean, you think about a couple of years ago, there was this argument that Luca might be the most valuable offensive player in the league. He's been kind of, you know, he he's been really better than that over some stretches of this year, and worse than that over some yeah. stretches. And Jokic has taken a step up, and you know that, and it's been it's been incredible. And the league is in a really good place, but that doesn't make the choice any easier. Mm -mm. So who would you vote for right now? I'd have, Jok vote I'd have Jokic, Jokic one, and then who? And then, so, and especially because Embiid and Giannis have played similar amounts, I think between those two, it, it really is splitting hairs. It's so gross. I, it's so gross. I think I'd probably, as we're recording this right now, I think I'd go Embiid over Giannis, but I've been arguing that Giannis's defensive defensive part of this is underappreciated, so it's it's real close. I think right now I would go the same. I think I would go Jokic, Embiid, Giannis. I 
the fact that Jokic has gotten so much better defensively, even this year than what he was last year. I think right. he was good last year. I think he is genuinely like a not just plus defender, like a very good defender now. Uh, he executes their scheme perfectly. I do have the same concerns you do in the playoffs, but in terms of executing their regular season scheme, which is generally effective when he's on the court, yeah, I, I don't think you can really come up with too many concerns there anymore. And he's the captain of the defense. Um, well, so I'll, honest, I'll, bring like up, I, I'll bring up one interesting point there. I was looking this up uh, as we, as you said, you wanted to do an MVP conversation. One thing, like I, I'm sure there will be people argue that, and this is this is true, that the Bucks defense when Giannis is on the floor, the Sixers defense when, as we're recording this, when Joel Embiid is on the floor, the the Nuggets are actually in that conversation in terms of defensive rating when each of these players is out there. However, one consideration to think about for this is kind of why why and how are they getting there, and part of it is that right now, the Nuggets opponents and Sixers opponents are shooting a lot worse from three and Bucks opponents are shooting worse from around the basket. And so I want to kind of, I've been arguing that Giannis should be in the defensive player of the year conversation partially on this reason is that what do you do? Well, why is the defense succeeding? Yeah. And Milwaukee, they're doing the math problem. They're preventing shots at the rim. They're not fouling very much. They're doing all those normal things. And it's not Giannis and Brooke Lopez. It's Giannis and Bobby Portis and Giannis and smaller players than Bobby Portis. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and like, look, Bobby Portis has had a really good year. Like, he, sure. I, I actually think he has been, for the most part, okay on defense. And he's shoot, he's averaging 15 points per game and shooting 40%. He is executing the scheme defensively. Let's go with that. He's not like a plus defender, but he is not demolishing the Bucks when he's out there, at least. Uh, the Bucks' bigger problems tend to be like the bench units, I feel like, with defense. Right. Like they have no chance to stop anyone when their bench is in, it feels like. Um, you, you take even like one of Drew or Giannis off the court, and it's just like, oh, this is a problem, especially Giannis. Um, I, I don't know, man. I think I would go Jokic, Embiid, Giannis right now. I think I would have Luka for fifth i i don't know i i mean well and and hopefully those four or five spots clarify over the rest of the season it would be hard for me to see somebody jump into that top three because those guys have played so well for such a large portion of the season yeah but like you know steph curry had a great first half he's fallen off and now he's out he's probably going to miss something close to the rest of the regular season so yeah. there there's a spot there kevin durant missing time opened up that and we'll have to see really where all that goes and I am totally fine, you know, like giving the giving those extra spots to players who played really well over a shorter period of time or players who played a little less well over longer, like Jason Tatum could potentially get on my ballot. Luca, of yeah. course, could get on my ballot. LeBron is weird because I'm sure that the counting stats, those who those who prioritize that are gonna gonna make this argument that he's, you know, putting up crazy numbers. But also part of that is that they've been sacrificing defense and that as as good as he has been, it hasn't elevated the Lakers because look at where yeah. they are. And yeah, I mean, just even thinking about like the forward race for all NBA. Oof. And and like, like I, and and I think of forward, I think of that, and this gets into a whole other can of worms. I personally, I'm more aggressive than I think most of our media brethren. That all NBA to me is all most outstanding, not most valuable. So as long as you yeah. played half the season. So then you get into the point of it's like. Okay, if you don't care about minutes played, has Kevin Durant been better than Giannis, than Jimmy Butler, than some of these other guys? Because yeah. you could say he's not in the top end of the MVP race because he hasn't played enough. But if you think about the All NBA criteria, as straight up most outstanding, then you start to have this whole argument. You relitigate it with different criteria. Yeah, I mean, like you have to have ahead of LeBron at the very least. You have to have Giannis, Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum. Um, probably Jimmy. I think you have to have Jimmy Butler ahead, frankly. I, I wonder if you could do some category fraud and maybe slide Jimmy Butler into a guard spot. I, I would feel a little bit bad doing that. Well, speaking but, of category fraud, there's already already some indications that people might try to do that with Jokic and Embiid, the idea that those two true centers have to go somewhere. And the solution there is just don't have positions for all NBA. It's not that hard. You want it to be the 15 best players in the league. Yeah. 
Or yeah. if you want it to be really basic, and I've actually argued this for all star voting as well one front court, one back court, three wild cards, then you're functionally at the same point. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't see a world where LeBron gets anything more than third team all NBA. Look, I, I know the counting numbers are great. I mean, watch those Lakers games. He is like fully fucking disengaged. <laughs> like, but here, here's something, here's something wild to consider. I we love the guy. We don't know like, where things are going. LeBron James might average more points per game this year than at any point in his career. He's not there yet, but it is a possibility that he passes 0708. Actually, yeah. sorry, he probably won't pass 0506. Sorry, I'd forgotten that he had 31.4. He probably won't get there. He might get to 30 though. Uh, I mean, I don't. I'm defense. not arguing for it. I would not. I would not do it personally. But the the support for LeBron James is is the that well runs deep. Um, yeah. And I mean, and we're not even getting into the wildness of like third team, third team All NBA center, which is now getting significantly more competitive. Yeah, I mean, it has to be Towns or Gobert. It's one of the two, right? I, I would say Bam is probably a little bit lower than those guys, but I mean, Towns yeah. is coming on strong. Gobert is having a very good season in the ways that Rudy Gobert normally has a very good season. So it's actually yeah. a good question. I actually might have Bam ahead of Rudy now that you say that. Because Bam is a better, more versatile offensive player than Rudy. Like, I know that the screen assist mafia is going to come at my head for that. But, like, I, I mean, just in terms of being multi-versatile, in terms of being able to pass, run dribble handoffs at a high level, initiate offense in a real way, like, I don't know. I don't really see a real argument for Rudy over Bam. Do you? Offensively, particularly. I do because the idea that Rudy Gobert, like I brought this up in terms of I, I, having Rudy Gobert in the MVP conversation last year, his case isn't strong enough this year, obviously. But the idea no. that the defense is built around what he does. And so like his defense is so valuable because the Jazz have no other defenders. And so you can make an argument that Bam and I wouldn't. Oh, I'm, I'm talking purely on offense, not no, oh, on offense. Like, yeah, on, on offense yeah. between those two. Yeah, I would. I would lean, I mean, it's interesting. I was just looking at estimated plus minus, which is just one one thing of that. They they have Gobert higher. Um, I I think Bam is probably a more valuable conceptual offensive player, but what Rudy does for yeah. their offense is very important. I would have to really kind of sit and stew on that. Yeah, it's interesting because Rudy finishes literally everything. He creates the extra offensive possessions that he creates literally like by himself because the right. jazz don't crash like it, they bring four back and he is the only one hitting the offensive glass ever uh, maybe maybe i'm wrong maybe rudy does have a real case ahead of bam I, I can't player. the amount of time that i'm going to have to spend when we do awards on third team all nba center is going to be intensely frustrating but this is it's a good problem it's not like a oh no, we have to find somebody who's worth it. No, there are multiple viable contenders. You talked about the nastiness of the forward line. We haven't even mentioned yeah. DeMar DeRozan, who's having this unbelievable year. And there are going to be- I haven't mentioned Donovan Mitchell either, who's having yeah, a, he's, right. who and has so, taken a real step forward. I mean, this, to me, this will be one of the strongest all NBA classes we've ever seen. Yeah. Um, oh, and by the way, we talk about all of this great like talent across the league. This is one of the best rookie classes we've seen in years. And like, we also have numerous high-level players who could be in all NBA and best player in the world conversations who haven't played at all this year or have played very little. You know, Kawhi Leonard. It's... And where where in the world does a healthy Zion Williamson fit into all of this? It's, oh my god. I mean, we're we're heading for a very good place. And the unfortunate reality in the NBA, as in every professional sport, is that you're probably never going to get everybody available all the time. But the pool of quality is so incredibly high. And the hope is that a lot of it will age reasonably well and that these players will have a long time to play at this level or continue to improve. Yeah. No, I honestly hadn't even thought of Zion. And I think we all think that his upside is that of being a top five player in the world at some point. Yeah. Like he averaged 27 and 12 or 27 and nine, I'm sorry, as a 20 year old last year. And, like, and that even understates what he did the second half of last year, which was yeah. like Point Zion was truly special. And so I'm, I'm looking up. So last year's Zion, last year's splits for Zion 
it, after the All Star game because that's just the the I'm I'm doing this quickly with Basketball Reference. Sixty five percent true shooting, thirty two usage rate, and like and I I could and their their offense was ridiculous and everything else. Like he was the most. He was again in that kind of ballpark of like the role within the offense, and they were great. And I mean, yeah. it's there. There are so many phenomenal players, and also like I think generally teams are better run now than they were before, and also they have a, a from a coaching from a development standpoint, a better understanding of what you need to put around those players. There are fewer circumstances, definitely still some, where these players are being held back by terrible mm. roster construction. There's still some or coaching but, as well. Cause I think yeah. there are fewer bad coaches now as well. There are fewer, there's still some, but, um, and, and there, that is also, there are plenty more that I don't love in the postseason than I don't love in the regular season, but those are different constructs. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll talk about that maybe in the postseason <laughs> when that comes, cause it will come. Uh, for come. one team, one team in particular at the top of my head, uh, defensive player of the year. I want to talk about that for five minutes before we get out of here. Uh, because I think that is a very strange race right now. It to is. me, the two best defenders this year in the NBA have been Draymond Green and Bam Adebayo. Uh, I would say the third best defender has been Rudy Gobert. And all three of those players have missed significant time. Draymond more than any of them, followed by Bam, followed by Rudy. Uh, they've missed you know decreasing amounts of time. I would have, look, in, in like a pure vacuum, I would have Draymond Green number one. I would have Bam Adebayo number two. I would have Rudy Gobert number three in terms of like on a per minute basis, who I think has been the most impactful defender in the NBA. I I, I don't know. what I don't know how to vote for this. Like I, I genuinely do not know how to vote for this because on top of that, like the best defensive stretch I've seen from any team this year was probably Golden State to start the year. The second best defensive stretch has been the one that the myth, uh, the Boston Celtics are, are in the midst of right now. Um, they've been incredibly good basically since they got Derek White. And you have to have someone, like you have to have Marcus Smart or Rob Williams like in the mix, I think at the very least. Um, it, it's it's an unbelievable, it's a really weird defensive player of the year vote, I think. It is. And you also get into a conversation that I talked about a little bit in the context of like Jokic and everything else is how do you apportion credit? Like there are different teams that are doing really well defensively, but are they doing well because of that player? I agree with you that I think Draymond Green per minute has had the best defensive year, but I also don't know, like, so from MVP, I know how I calibrate on minutes played and all that because it's value. I've never really known for sure whether defensive player of the year is most outstanding defender, most valuable defender, or some weird hybrid of the two. And then there's also the question with Draymond of, is there a minimum, even if it is most outstanding? Because he's maybe going to play half the year. Like that's, yeah. that's really kind of the conversation that we're having. And you can argue that half the year isn't enough. Um, my, my inclination right now is that I brought up how Bam is kind of more valuable conceptually and sometimes than he is actually. I think that's true for my for Miami defensively as well. Like Gobert, he the Jazz when he is on the floor are doing the things that Rudy Gobert affects extremely well, and he's the only guy who can do that. I mean, Hassan Whiteside can at at a to a lesser extent when Gobert is not on the floor, and you can see the drop offs in those things when Gobert is out there. I I like to do that because it's easier to apportion that credit than it is a team concept. And Miami in particular, they play a few, of course, below average defenders. But generally speaking, their defensive caliber is higher. And so it's harder to say, this is yeah. Bam versus this is Jimmy Butler or PJ Tucker, or when he's available, Kyle Lowry. And all of them, I mean, and they have a lot, they have guys like Caleb Barton who have done a, who've done a really nice job defensively as well. So yeah. I'm, I'm partial. If we're saying, that Draymond Green is either in, inadmissible or has to be downgraded because of his availability and even his availability yeah. relative to the other two. So like we're doing this games played as we're recording this Draymond Green is at 36. Bam is at 45. Gobert is at 54. Like that is yeah. a huge difference. That isn't just it is. a few games and minutes played for all of them is in the same ballpark. I would it's say it's literally an extra, like, like, 
Draymond Green has played 36 games. Rudy Gobert has played 18 games more than Draymond Green. That's half of the amount of games that Draymond Green has played this year. Exactly. And and That's so you hard. have you it, it is really hard and you as you mentioned there are a lot of other players that could have potential cases. I'm not as sympathetic. We brought this up in terms of like I, I know 538's model has Jokic at number 2 in terms of defensive raptor. I'm not I'm not particularly sympathetic to that. I think that that's more yeah. how much they've fallen off. I think he's been very good, but not not in that sort of a sort of a conversation, but it is wide open and the beauty of defensive player of the year is that it might do what I've always said MVP does in the last month and a half of the season, which is we agonize and agonize about 2 months out, maybe a month and a half out, and then it clarifies because yeah. Somebody plays, somebody doesn't, somebody looks really good. Because remember, we're evaluating this at this point with between an eighth and a sixth of the season left. And so yeah. that matters. And some would argue it matters more. I'd say it matters exactly the same amount as the ones that preceded it. So if we're saying that Gobert and Adebayo are close, and I'm, I haven't done all my digging, but let's say, that's, let's say that for the scope, one of them is probably going to be better than the other over the remaining time. And there we go. Yeah. That that it might end up being that that basic, and it it's also like whether you want to talk about all defensive teams or even the ballot. Like, how do you apportion credit for some of these really good ensemble casts? The Celtics are a phenomenal example of that. Of just like okay, yeah. Robert Williams is doing these things well, but also they have a lot of really good defenders. And like there was a year I think Boston led the league in defense, and I didn't have any of their defensive players on. On, on my on my defensive player of the year ballot, like that can happen, and maybe well, that's and, under- oh by the way, like we haven't mentioned Giannis in this conversation yet, right? Either. And I think Giannis isn't to me; he deserves to be in this conversation because again, it's the apportioning yeah. credit. The, but what the Bucks are doing best defensively is the stuff that he contributes towards, and so yeah, he's yeah. he will. And, and I mean, um, Nate has brought up Jaron Jackson in this conversation. I know some would support Jaron yeah. Allen being in this conversation. And there are a lot of the, and also the growth of these other players as defenders, but it's a, it's hard. It's a very challenging conversation. Yeah. I would personally have Jaron Jackson, like just in the next grouping of players, like I'd have him with like the Rob Williams grouping and the Jared Jared Allen grouping and the um, Evan Mobley grouping, for instance, I think he's in that conversation as well. Sure. Um, It's hard. Like, you know, a month ago, I would have said Mikhail Bridges, and I don't know that I feel that way anymore. Like, I think he would be first team all defense for me. Well, and, like, and I think my two guards like, would be him and Marcus Smart. But like, there's also a challenge know. of reconciling best defensive player, like you know, in terms of guarding their assignments versus a team construct. It's a whole bunch of different stuff. It's, I mean, and yeah. defense is harder to quantify and evaluate than offenses because at yeah. least. I, I mean, and and you can get into there and defense. There's a larger propensity for things that are harder to control being credited to individual player. It's 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 really hard. Well, even even not even not even statistically. Sure. Right. Like oh, even yeah. while just watching tape. Right. Like you know, you see a guy close out too heavy. A closeout gets attacked by a ball handler. Center has to help over guy attacking the closeout hits the dump off back to the center's man, you know, power forward pushes down from the top of the paint to try and contest that shot. You know, center or, or, hits the wrap around to the top of the key. And you're just like, okay, like we can't really apportion credit here. Or you know I'll, what give, I mean? you, I'll like, give you an even more really basic one. Do. Center steps beyond out on, the initial fuck up center st- steps out on driving point guard, contest the shot, doesn't block the shot, doesn't get credit for the block. The man that, and, but because the other teammate blew the assignment, then because he has to do that and makes the right play, his cover gets an offensive rebound and a putback, which then counts against your counts against your defensive rebounding and counts against your um, field goal yeah. percentage at the rim. It's a probably yeah, and it's, still out. And so it's like all of that stuff. And if you play on a team that does enough, that does enough, but then you can also say over the course, of the season, it's, it's, there's so much. I think that on my ballot right now, I would have, I think I would have Rudy. I think I would have Bam. And I think I would have Marcus Smart. I think those are the three that I would have. I, I Marcus think... Smart has literally played twice as many minutes as Draymond Green this year. 
I, I like, I just kind of can't get past that. That's too right, much. Yeah. For right now, I think I would have Draymond off my ballot. He's just played so little. I think I would go Rudy one, Giannis two, Bam three. But I would really, when when I actually do words, I will spend some real time on it. Yeah. Uh, and I get that. Like, it's a hard, this is, this is a tough year. This is a really, really tough year for defensive player of the year. And it's because of all the missed time. Um, speaking of missed time. We have not done this in a while, and I'm very glad that we got a chance to do this. But uh, I'm very tired, and I have oh, and, and Iowa... you have, but you have a light, you have a light four days ahead of you, so that'll be nice. You can recover. I do, and I will be up at three o'clock in the morning every single day to do that. Um, Danny, tell the people where they can find your work. Tell the people uh, what's going on. Tell the people what's going on in your life. Like it, we didn't even get a chance to catch up. Like tell tell them, you know, how how are things in the Bay Area. Thing, things are great. Uh, weather is getting a little bit warmer, um, though San Francisco, it's still mid 60s Fahrenheit. Sorry, you're now in Celsius land, which is fine. Um, <laughs> still I haven't mean, figured I've, that out yet. Have have a lot going on. I mean, so Nate and I, Nate Duncan and I are doing Dunked On and Dunked On Prime. So it's a mix of a subscriber model four times a week and then public episodes as well. We also do Spotify Green Room, which are conversations kind of like a call in radio show, which is really fun. And then we call live games on um, NBA League Pass. It's called the NBA Strategy Stream. It is every Monday. I don't know if it's Mondays in Australia. It's probably Tuesdays in Australia. But we yes. have really good matchups. Um, we're still doing that throughout the rest of the regular season. And then I write for The Athletic, and I do Real GM Radio, which is my, one of my oldest, longest-running commitments, and I love. And that's where I often talk to you. And we do that, and that can go... It's try to be more evergreen content, so it can be on any number of different subjects. I actually just recorded with Caitlin Cooper on the Pacers right before we recorded this, so that'll be out in the near term as well. How fucking good is Caitlin Cooper? Phenomenal. Every single time I like see her work, I'm just like, this is fucking incredible. Like, I I am I have been privately, but now I will do so more publicly. Been pushing her. I'm like, if you want to extend your analysis to more teams, to more spaces, I would love for you to do it. I will push it as hard as I can. But as always, that is everyone's choice. And you know, I've and I'm so <laughs> thrilled for her to do what she loves and to be so damn great at it. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Uh, I will have college basketball content. Uh, my bank account is taking just a hit so far because Colorado State. You didn't watch the end of that game. But I had over 139 and a half, I think. Okay. And Colorado State missed four threes in the final minute, and the game oh. finished at 138. Oh. Uh, so that was not great. Oh. Uh, and then I had under in Rutgers Notre Dame yesterday. That did not go well. Uh, yeah. What else did I have? I had I had Bryant. I had hashtag Peter Kiss. That did not go well. I'm hoping that the Providence, the correct Providence handicap that I nailed from the jump, will jumpstart me. But I will have betting content over at The Athletic. Uh, there are picks up there right now. So please go uh, subscribe and look at all of that content. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel, Game Theory Podcast with Sam Vicini. Uh, go subscribe to the podcast. Uh, go, I don't know, man. I'm tired. Let's, let's end this. Uh, until next time, we will talk soon. Bye.